And good morning on the first of a nice lazy Saturday mornings. I hope you're all well. I'm currently waking up and uh, waiting for an encoding to finish for the Wells Part 3 class. So while I was planning the KDF side of ships that I'm planning to do shortly, I thought I'd have a little quick moment to take a break and actually go through the Regent plant with class with my engineer. And this is kind of a video response to a video channel that I recently subscribed to, to an uh, gentleman I should say called Boldly They Road, and I'll put a link into his YouTube page um, in the description notes a little bit later when I put this up. And this is a video response to his region class, and it's been interesting watching these videos because he's been putting a nice fresh spin on things. He's quite new, new to the game still, so he's finding his feet. And I wanted to do a video response and just show him a comparison to what I do on my region class. And this is in no shape or form a criticism of his videos. This is purely just how I do mine and I wanted to do a video response. As you see, my region class is a little bit different uh, to most you probably see out there. I'm not a huge fan of the mesh that comes with the region class as standard. It's not bad, but it's not my personal taste and I really do prefer the um, look at the assault cruiser. But I wanted to spin this up a little bit. So being a bit of a role play fan myself and I've done many a many a game and role play back in the days of Dungeons and Dragons and uh, oh and many other games after that board games before I even got anywhere near the computers. I opted to make my ships always have a little bit of a backstory to them. So what I decided to do is this ship in role play is a little bit of a mismatch. She was built after the Sovereign class and she was also built as a test bed for the old Imperial class which if those of you that have been around in game a long time will remember the Imperial mesh which is no longer available from the um, Z store or the C store and has now become the de facto mesh for the tier 5 shipyards if you want to get that far within your fleet you'll actually have access to a fleet region class or a fleet asset assault cruiser which has got an extra tactical slot. So what I decided to do was make this a bit of a mismatch of parts and basically it tells the story of three different ship designs. So this ship basically had a lot of influence from the so very successful Sovereign class ships. She was a test bed for some of the Imperial class ships hence on the neck and saucer area you notice I'm using the Imperial top neck and top part. So well, I've got the mouse waggling at the moment. Basically what I always imagine that to be is actually a massive sensor array, so for me it's testing sensor systems. And then she was also an initial test bed for some of the technology used in the region class, so she's got the region class make cells on the uh, pylons. So for me this kind of is a bit of a mismatch, but it kind of works very nicely for me. Um, if you've got an AJS shield array, this actually looks pretty awesome. But what I decided to do was I took out the um, uh, AJS set, set and I'm running this ship pretty much as a test ship. Um, whenever I take the ship out it's used to test out a couple of theories and a couple of ideas without testing it on my main ship or uh, what I tend to do is test it out on here first and then if the test is successful I port everything over onto my Odyssey class. Now my Odyssey's actually had a bit of refit console files and I'll be making a little short video of that a little bit later on over the weekend. Uh, probably won't be a very short video, probably only about five minutes. Uh, but just charting sort of the evolution of refits. So yeah, this ship is a little bit of a mismatch in meshes, but she is the salt region class. Now if I just move around a little bit, you can actually see that it's actually not too bad looking. It's certainly worse out there. Obviously, you don't have access to the saucer area's uh, hangar bay, which has pretty much become redundant, and we're using the secondary hulls hangar deck instead, but that's a happy trade-off for me for look-wise. See the ship's called the Renown, uh, named after a World War II naval vessel, and because this is a test bed ship that I've used for a lot of testing, she's got the NX class registry on her. And as you can see, I've also gone for um, because you'll see the consoles and my and set piece of music shortly. But I decided not to use any extra visuals on this ship other than the particular engines, and I'll show you what engines I'm using a little bit shortly. But yeah, I've gone for a slightly more aged look to the ship. So as you can see, if I browse around so you can see she looks a little bit older, a little bit more worn in that particular skin that I picked. But she's actually a very nice, actually, I will be honest, she's actually a very interesting ship. And actually handles very unusual. 
And as you can see, there is a mismatch of parts there that doesn't look too bad. And as I said, I'm not a massive fan of the Regent skin itself. So this one's a bit of a modification to my own test. So as I said, she's actually a test vessel that I use to test different ideas and theories on her. And I'll actually let you have a look at the consoles on here. And I do use the ship from time to time. I use it in STS. Now most of you already know what my character's build spec is, you can see the third part of the Odyssey build. But if we actually go through the Renowns consoles, um, it's a little bit different and a little bit of a mismatch, some might think, but actually surprisingly works very, very well. And this kind of demonstrates if you've not actually got the full STF gear yet, then the ship could actually be quite respectful and as you're grinding through. So let's discuss the weapons that I'm using first in this one and then I'll move on to I'll see the deflector implants and shields. Now weapon rise, because of what you probably can see already, but the choice of deflector and engines that I've used, I've actually gone polarons on this ship and I've not got around yet to picking up the fleet weapons. Uh, mainly because I'm also actually one of the founding members of our fleet, one of three. And as such I tend to be the last to pick up fleet weapons. I tend to sort of obviously help contribute to the projects and let other people get hold of them before I do so. That's just kind of a little bit of who I am really, so I don't like to ever look like I'm taking advantage. So at the moment I'm using my standard configuration of five beam arrays, which works very nicely for me to help keep weapon system power up. And as an engineer I find this a little bit more useful for me. And all of the five polon arrays that I'm using are the RC Mark 11 purples, and they've got accuracy, crit D, and damage as their modifier. So we're looking at 283 polar on damage with 228 DPS on that array and it's also got the plus 20 critical severity and the plus 10 accuracy as well. Now I might actually, if the ship gets a bit more used in test beds, I may actually increase the accuracy on this but this is a pretty much good all-rounder. It's obviously not doing as high damage as some of the fleet weapons you can get but it's still a very decent set of weapons on here so she handles very nicely. So that's the five beam arrays that I'm using. My old ever faithful Harping torpedo launcher is in the forward array as one of my torpedo launchers. Now I'm actually at the stage where I'm actually thinking about replacing this torpedo with something else. Now just recently my character actually got to tier 5 on the Omega system, uh, Re Omega reputation system I should say. And what I'm doing now is because this character actually had most sets before season 7, I'm kind of getting around now to doing the extra weapons. And one of the little projects I'm running at the moment, which I'm not there yet, is oh, I've got to, got to do some Omega grinding shortly, is that I'm getting the Omega torpedo launcher. And I'm going to fit this on my Odyssey and on my test bed ship here on and off. And the reason I want this is it actually looks like a really interesting little weapon, this one. So I'm going to see what she does. She's got some fantastic DPS and plasma damage over time. And I've already got the first part of the Omega set, which obviously as you know the Borg set got separated from four to three pieces, and the Universal Console is no longer part of the Borg set, it's now part of what's called the Omega Adaptive Borg Technology. And what I'm going to do is, on this test bed, is replace this torpe harping torpedo with the, obviously the plasma torpedo or the Omega Torpedo Launcher I should say and the hope is that I might be able to take advantage of the Borg uh, or I should say the Omega set, two part set and for those that don't know what that does and if I just scroll down a moment I'm hoping to get the set two part which will be a 2.5% chance to self to apply to Omega weapon application which basically means I've got a plus 10 to my current weapon power plus 500 current power resistance weapon power resistance rating for 3 seconds and plus 500 maximum power resistance rating for the game for 3 seconds. So if I understand this correctly it means that I'm also going to get resistance to my power drains, especially my weapons. Um, so I'm hoping that will also mean that I keep my power levels up higher in my weapons which means I can run higher DPS and I'll be doing some extra damage. So it's a little bit of a test at the moment and it's only a 2.5% chance of kicking in. But I figured that when I looked at my build spec on my Odyssey class and compared it to this test build here which uses the same sort of weapon loadout, it should be an interesting test to see how the Borg, that Borg torpedo does from the reputation system. So I've got some long grinding to do to get there but uh, I think it's going to be worth it when I get there. Now I'm not going to get the Borg cutting beam because I don't actually use the full um, Borg set. 
Um, there's also another device that you can get at um, if I bring it up very quickly. So if you bear with me just while I find it. Down, down, deeper and down, for those old enough to remember the song. And I'm probably showing my age a little bit, but we'll get there eventually. Probably have shot it, which I probably have indeed. Let's go back and find it. Listen to you folks. This list goes on and on and on. Here we go. The cutting beam space weapon, which is unlocked at tier two. Um, I'm not going to get this because I prefer to run five arrays. I could drop to four, and I have successfully run crews with four beam arrays and four torpedoes launches 2-4-2 two, two aft, but I don't use the um, full three-part Borg space set, so as such, really this weapon also gets a bit of a bonus that if you use the Borg tractor beam and then hit with this as well, you get a bit of a bonus to damage. I know I've seen a lot of videos with people using it at the moment, but I'm opting not to go for this for the time being, so I'm quite happy to just pick up the um, Omega Torpedo Launcher, which I'm currently working towards. Anyway, I digress there, sorry, but... Hopefully it gives you some ideas on how to build your ships and how you want to do things. Now, as I said, this is a test ship, so it doesn't necessarily always have the best weapons, but the forward torpedo launcher on here is actually one of the ones you can't get hold of now because these weapons have become a little disappeared from um, the STF shop in DS9. But this is a quantum torpedo launcher with crit D, crit H and Borg on it. So I get a plus 2% critical chance of damage, I get a plus 20% critical severity, and the Borg part is I get a thousand damage resistance versus Borg NPCs and this is a proc to actually kick in I can't remember the percentage off the top of my head <coughs> excuse me but um, yeah this was just one of those torpedoes I had banging around in my bank so I decided to throw that in there now the aft torpedo launcher is my ever faithful which has become very popular in my mind for my build is the wide angle quantum torpedo launcher with accuracy, crit, H and arc so I get a little bit of a plus 2% critical chance, I get 10% accuracy, and I've got that 180 degree target mark, which means I can run my broadsides and just keep the aft torpedo launcher for high yield available. So this works quite nicely for me. Now moving on to obviously deflector impulse and shields, this is where this ship becomes a test bed. And as such, I'm actually running the Jem'Hadar space set, which you can get from the um, running the missions as part of the story arc, which is under here, under the Cardassian, and if we scroll right down here, it's all part of the um, second wave series, and you can basically get these from running some of the missions. Um, you can get the shield array you can get from it, it's from Boldy the Road, I won't hit the replay button now because you'll hear all the dialogue text in the background. Uh, that gets you the shield, and then if you run Operation Gamma twice, you can pick up the deflector and the um, impulse engine. Now, something else to note is that you can also now upgrade this equipment through the Lobby store. They've released an update that you can buy to update the kit to Mark 12 status purples. Um, there's been a lot of slating on the forums at the moment. People have not been very impressed with the stats. And at least on paper when I look at them, I'm not overly impressed with the updates that they've had, but it's still in early days, and I've noticed a couple of forum posts where the devs are actually watching the posts to see feedback, so we might see that change a little bit, but we'll have to wait and see. But I don't actually mind the space set itself, it's quite an interesting little bit of a space set, so um, if you're sort of finishing up the end of game but you've not run the reputation system, then you can't get too wrong with this space set although you might want to change out the shields. The shields are okay, but they um, do lack a bit of um, hit points, and as such, we're going to have to run a very high shield power to keep them regenerated or regenerating quicker. Uh, what I would probably do is go for two part of it and then pick a shield of your choice. Um, back in the day, I would have probably recommended the covariant shield array for cruisers, but times have changed a little bit, and the covariants don't always seem as best on the cruisers as they used to. They certainly soak up a fantastic amount of alpha damage if you get alpha strike, but um, with the advent of the Mako shield that's kind of set the benchmark for pretty much for all cruisers or any ships in general within the Federation fleet side. So I would probably recommend picking up a resilient shield array, um, either from your fleet store, those ones are fantastic if you can get them, 
or um, just pick up a resilient shield in general and see if you can get something like uh, cap on it or um, generation so that you get a better regeneration rate on them as well. With the resilience you get 5% absorption and 5% bleed through so 5% of the damage gets soaked up into your shields and the other 5% actually hits your hull. And as I said, I'm a former covariant shield man, but I've been pretty much converted over to resilience. So I'm, as I said, you might want to go for resilient shield because the Mako shields itself are resilient anyway. Um, and I'm actually running resilient on this one, which I'll come into in a moment. But um, yeah, if you can't afford yet to pick up a fleet shield, for example, and you haven't run the reputation to pick up a Mako shield, then just pick up a standard resilient shield. Try and get the best one you can for the mark. Look for something with cap in it, and look for something maybe with regeneration for the shields as well. Anyway, moving on to back to the deflect where we were. I'm running the Gem Hunt Deflect Edition. This purely, it's kind of a test measure. Um, this is quite a useful little set, really, when you think about what they were trying to, what those were trying to do with it. You get a plus one percent starship sh stealth detection, which is quite useful for stealth ship picking up uh, ships that are on the stealth. So it's not bad. I'm not 100 sure if it procs well enough or not, but it's not bad really. It's uh, if you understand the story behind the Gemini, if you watch any of the Deep Space Nine series. Um, you can see what they were going for. The Gemini seemed to have no problem ever picking up the Defiant when she was under cloak. <laughs> Now the other parts you get with this is you get a plus 24.42 starship flow capacitors. So this actually starts, when you think about it, it starts to look quite useful for a science vessel for example. Because flow capacitors is basically what you use, it's a skill that you use to drain weapon systems. Uh, or it's a skill that actually affects drain. So if I bring up my character at the moment and I'll bring up this description for the flow capacitors. Basically, as it says in the description, the skill improves your starship shield and energy drain abilities. So in a science vessel, if you're getting towards the end of the game, or got to the end of the game, but not gone through what I said, the rep system, then actually you're getting a bonus to your flow capacity. So on a science ship, this actually works quite nicely, but on a cruiser it doesn't work too badly either. Um, I don't on this particular build at the moment, as I said, she's only a test ship, but I could run, if I was spec this to new flow capacities, I could use this to drain the target shield. So quite useful that one. Use that skill or not. The other thing you get with this is a plus 24.42 Starship Inertial Dampeners. Um, so, for those of you that don't remember, or if you just caught this video for the first time, the Inertial Dampeners is basically a skill that grants you your resistance to hold and disables and repels and tractor effects. So, it's another way of basically it's a skill that stops you from being held, which is always good to have. So again, that's not bad for a deflector. And then you get a plus 24 to the Starship Graviton Generators, where if you're a science toon, this works really, really well, because you're going to use Graviton Generators. And additionally, you get the plus 24.4 to Starship Countermeasures. So if you're using things like Jam, Sensor Array, uh, again as a science toon, again, it's quite a useful ability. So it's definitely worth grabbing. And then moving on from there to the Impulse Engines. Now, at the moment, these engines are pretty good. They're efficient actually at low power levels, but I run a slightly lower. I run actually run over 50 on my power, so really what you want to do is uh, down, turn down my engine power, but this is working quite nicely for me. And what it does is it's a very interesting engine. You basically get a de relatively decent flight speed, a plus 16.8. You get what is at the moment one of the best um, turn rates as well. This engine actually gives you an extra boost to your turn rate. I think it's actually, I think, unless I'm happy to be corrected, it actually gives you the best flight turn, plus flight turn rate of any engine at the moment in game. Um, so you might consider this engine on say like an uh, exploration class vessel, a Galaxy, to help it turn, or even the Galaxy X, or even the Odyssey, this is an engine that you could actually consider maybe putting on it. You might consider maybe running the Mako Shields and the Mako Deflector and maybe run the Gemadar engines to give you an extra bonus to your turn. It's a choice, it's just a thought out there. As I said, this is my test build ship, so I run this for testing. Now the other thing you get with this is a plus 2.5 weapon power bonus, or at least on this ship, that's what I get on here, so I get a bonus to my weapons. And if you're running your, the other bonus you get is if you're running your weapon system to a lower setting, so say for example you're putting more power into auxiliary and you're reducing your weapon power as compensation, you get a bonus to your weapon power here and it increases that low weapon power. So basically, if I reduce my weapon power setting now, I'd actually start getting an additional bonus to my weapon system. So this engine can, could actually work really nice in a science ship. So something to bear in mind there for you folks. I mean, 
I know a lot of people are not a fan of the Gemini Space set, but it does have its charms. If you just look at it, there's actually a surprise amount of little bits of uh, usefulness that come in there. Now, as I said, I may be running the two-part set, and I'll move on to the shields, and then I'll explain why I may be running two-part. Now, I got the Mako Mark 12 Resilient Shields. I got this, not part of the reputation, but I just got a happily lucky drop before Season 7 launched. Um, which was quite a lucky one, and I happened to get a Mark 12 Shield Array. Now, I don't run it on my Operations Odyssey, because obviously you have to have the same Mark to get the whole three-part bonus set. So, on this occasion, I'm running the uh, Mark on Make 12s or the 12s on here. But as I said, you could just run a standard Brazilian shield. Just make sure you look for something with cap and hopefully shield regeneration as well, just to help bring the shields back up quickly. So I get a pretty decent shield power here. Most of you already know what the Mako shield set is like. It's a resilient one, 5% uh, absorption, 5% uh, bleed through. And um, basically, when you receive damage, you also get the old power conduit link. So with the Mark 12, you get a plus 2 or power settings for 15 seconds. And basically what that means is every time Power Conduit Link kicks in, it procs, you'll get, I believe it's up to a stack of 10 plus 2 to your power settings. So the more that kicks in, the more your power levels are going to go up by 2, go up by 2, go up by 2. And it's quite useful in my operations, obviously, and it's quite useful, especially on this one, because she's going to be running 56 on engine power. But she actually gets a plus two, a plus two, and a plus two to engine. So I'm getting a bit more speed, I'm getting a little bit more turn out of the ship. So it's quite useful sh shield. You don't have to have the Mark 12. You can only get the Mark 11, that's fine. Don't worry about it too much. The other thing to bear in mind that reduces all energy damage to shields by 10%, uh, but that's only if I run a shield battery. So if I run a shield battery, I'm getting a reduction on my um, shields. But it's also a massive reduction on plasma damage, which is what the Borg use a lot, and since it's a lot of end game, and with Rohan, uh, Rehan, sorry, and the um, Romulan reputation system, you're also getting the um, uh, plasma damage there, where the enemies are using plasma weapons as well. So yeah, the Mako shield is fantastic really, um, it, it's pretty much set the benchmark for cruiser shields, or just shields in general as I said before. Now, why did I pick the Gemini Space Set 2-part and not 3-part? Because I know a couple of people might be curious. Well, the reason I did is that if you get the 2-part set, in fact there's a couple of bonuses, but if you get 2-part, you get what's called Dominion Synergy. And this is a passive ability, and what it does is you get a plus 8.1 to your polar on damage, which, okay, isn't a massive a lot, but I'll take any extra little bit of damage I can get. Especially on this build, because I don't run all three to console, tactical consoles for polar on damage. I even run two of them, and you'll see why later. So, yep, you get the plus 8.1 polar on damage. And then with the Dominion Synergy, you also get a plus 16.2 to your Starship Power Isolators. Which basically means this is a possibility of reduction to the amount of weapon drain, or any drain of your subsystems that you might come across. So if someone's using, say, drain shield, target, uh, shield sorry, you'll get another bonus to your... Uh, resistance to those shields being, uh, sorry, the uh, power levels getting drained. So it's always quite useful that. So I picked it because I'm using the full polar on weapons and the extra little bit of power insulation is always handy. And I should imagine the space that actually works really well with Gemini bug, but unfortunately I don't have the bug so I can't test it. I've never got around to getting one. Now for those of you that want to know, you can also, if you get the three part set, you can get the um, anti-proton sweep. sweep. Uh, basically it's a minus to shield, it's a bit of an AOE area for 90 degree cone of effect. And it basically um, does an anti-proton sweep and it does minus 1389.2 shields on uh, 5 enemies over a period of time. It also disables cloaking systems, so that's actually quite useful as well if you want a, an ability to drain systems. Now, on a cruiser you could run a gem color shield, but I'd probably recommend you run one or two um, field generators to bump up what power you're getting. It's not got the highest uh, figures, although with the Odyssey class shield modifier and even the Regent one that I'm using, you get a pretty decent modifier. But it's certainly worth considering. Now, if you've got a Gemadar vessel or the Cardassian Galore, or any of the Gemadar vessels now, because obviously the new Dominion lockbox that's come out, there's one little extra bit you get with this, which is the Victory's Life, it's an enhancement. And it's basically a 1% chance to strip one buff while using Polar on weaponry. So, a little bit of an extra thing there. I'm not sure if it's worth it or not, but 
I'll let those that have the full set on the gem ship actually respond to that one. Something I meant to say actually, just a digress momentarily on opponent on beam arrays. There's also a 2.5% chance of minus 25 to all current power levels for a target for 5 seconds. So it kind of has an inbuilt power drain as well, which I can see why Polar on weapons are sometimes favoured quite a lot by signed ships. And if it wasn't for the fact that I was using my Temporal Warfare suite on my Wells class, I might actually consider swapping over to Polar on. Um, but I like running the way I'm run, running my Wells class, so I haven't done that yet. Now in the device slots, this is nice and simple really, and pretty self-explanatory. Shield batteries, weapon batteries, and then deuterium surplus, which is done by one of the dailies you can do over in the neutral zone. Uh, you can stack in, they stack in five, and when you activate one of these, you get plus four, 440% flight speed strength for eight seconds. You get a massive boost to your turn rate, another plus 440. Very useful this if you're running an Odyssey. Actually, you could throw deuterium surplus on, hit the tap pack and Omega, inertial to dampness, and invasive maneuvers, and upset an escort that's stuck on your rear end. Especially if you've tracked a beam them suddenly they find themselves looking at the bow of an Odyssey class rather than the stern. And then in the last device slot is my ever faithful subspace field modulator. Um, this is just universal on all my builds. It's a really good little con console, sorry, device I should say. And it gives you a damage resistance. It also gives you a plus 15 to a defense for 15 seconds. So it's definitely worth grabbing one of these. Now in my engineering consoles, I've got the board console, which gives you the bonus to your critical chance and critical severity, gives you the plus 5 to your weapon power, gives you a plus 5.1 to your hull repair, so you get a little bit more out of your hull repairing, and again it gives you another boost to the graviton generators. Now on this occasion I'm not really using graviton generators on this particular build, but it's always handy if you do use them, there's quite a nice few ways now of boosting up your graviton generators. And so this is a test ship, so for the most part I'm using blue consoles on here. Um, I've got the old Neutronium Alloy, which is my other faithful console that comes in a lot. And that gives you the 17.5 kinetic damage and the all 17.5 energy damage resistance rating. I then happen to have a blue Mark 12 ablative hull armor. I tend to use this one because it favors most of the popular weapons you'll come across. And it's a resistance 21.1 to phaser, disruptor, plasma and tetrion. Now I could swap this console out for one that just gives you the plus 35, I believe, to the plasma, which I'll just double check with my groggy old mind. Uh, yeah, the old electro ceramic, which gives you the plus 35 to plasma damage. As and when, if I'm doing an elite, then I'm not STF, then I'll probably swap that over. But to be honest, I'm not having any complaints using your ablative and just the neutronium. It does really well. It gives me some decent defense. And then my last console in this case, and I took this out for a while because I've been taking it out of my build, but I've actually put it back in. Even in my Odyssey, she's had this put back in, funny enough, which I'll do another video on a bit later. And it's basically the Odyssey's console gives you the plus 37.5 to flight turn speed, uh, turn rate, sorry. Uh, basically, it's just increasing the turn. And although a lot of people say the percentage of the bonus you get is negligible, especially in the cruiser, I found by putting this back into my Odyssey class and even in this ship, just gives me that little bit of extra turn, especially when I'm using emergency to dampeners. And it's just made the vessel that little bit more manoeuvrable. Now I don't mean pointing or forever pointing the ship's bow towards the target, but it just gives me a little bit more flexibility about how I can turn and how I can bring my weapons to bear. So it just makes me that little bit more manoeuvrable. And she is an assault cruiser refit after all. And as such, the refit really ought to be a little bit more manoeuvrable. It's not as manoeuvrable as the unfair benchmark of the Excelsior class, but it certainly puts, her, puts it up there. Now my science consoles, I've got the field generator, only a Mark 11 blue, which also gives you the plus 17.5% to your shield capacity. So what well, that basically equates to, at the moment, my shields are running at 10, 2, 8, 1. So not too bad, not as high as my, my um, Operations Odyssey. Not as high as a lot of science vessels can get it, but it is up there decently high, and I've got some processes in place that I can boost my shields anyway. And we'll go into that a little bit later. And then a change from my usual build, and this is something I'm doing at the moment, is actually dropping my biofunction monitors, um, which increase your crew recovery rates. Uh, in recent weeks, I kind of becoming slowly not sure about the biofunction monitors and I've got a purple mark 12 in my operations odyssey and as part of the test on this ship and I've put this test over to my operations odyssey but I've actually removed it now and slotted in the emitter array uh, this is just a blue mark 11 at the moment 
and this gives me a plus 26.2 to my Starship emitters. And what this basically means is it's a skill that improves all your Starship shield repair and healing abilities. Now this ship runs two versions of emergency power shields. I've got emergency power shields three and emergency power shields one. But it also improves the science team stent shields, rotate shield frequency and transfer shield strength. Now this has been a test that's actually been working quite well for me and I have migrated this over to my operations odyssey and she happens to have a purple bag uh, marked what Mark 11 which happens to be cheap on the exchange. And as such has increased my healing abilities and my shields. Now those that know my operations class know I only run immense power shields and transfer shield strength. And I found that on this ship it doesn't have quite the same modifiers as my operations odyssey, but I'm still getting some very good numbers now for my shield regeneration, even with emergency power shield one, and even with transfer shield strength. Now the ops odyssey comes out better transfer shield strength for its numbers, but the numbers here are still respectful. So I've swapped it over and it's been giving me some pretty decent extra bonuses to my shield repair. And before I started making this video, I took my Operations Odyssey out for a test drive in just a normal STF and actually didn't miss my biofunction monitor blades at all. And having a purple in there actually um, helped me increase my shield repair rate as well. So I think that console is pretty much here to stay, but as I said, it's, I've only just started with testing in the last three or four days, so I haven't quite made my mind absolutely up, but I think in my Operations Odyssey and certainly in this test build, that console is going to stay. Now moving on to the tactical side of things, I've got two blue Mark 11 Polaron phase modulators which are basically the plus 26.2 to your Polaron damage. Now in an ideal world I would have put six, three in here, but what I want to do is I want to put a little extra console in here. Now it's one of the universe ones you can pick up. Now, this is originally from the KDF side and those of you that can get the lock boxes or if you just look at the exchange you can find these now on the exchange to pick up. And this is the Universal Theta Radiation Vents. And basically, this is Jet Warp Plasma, for want of a better word. It's an AOE effect, uh, it's a dot, and it's basically ejects a Theta Radiation Cloud or a Warp Plasma behind you. And it's minus 2.4% crew every second. It's a 4,720 perception in perception, a minus. It's also a minus 70.4 to all shields every second. And it's also a minus 50 to turn rate and a minus 50 for impulse speeds. Now this ship is very very maneuverable and as such I can, unlike my Odyssey where I don't favour it, I do favour it here on this particular ship because she's maneuverable enough to use it. And it's not uncommon for me to unleash the best of the equivalent of an alpha attack that I can muster. And then as I run over the target I drop this on top of them turn to give them a full broadside and I usually would probably be either using beam overload still or at least high yield on them and again I may swap things over a little bit and what I might do as it's still a test is I could actually swap and have three beam arrays forward and have two torpedo launchers aft and I should imagine a tricolbot and the stern or a mine or even the um, Orga Mega Torpedo might be quite nice in this particular build, but it's still early days yet. But it's certainly going to upset someone when it runs over the target. It's definitely going to upset their day. Now then, that's pretty much the set pieces that I'm using in this test bit. I suppose I ought to really go over the bridge officer abilities that I'm using in this one. And for those that don't know, the refit assault cruiser comes with a Lieutenant Commander Tactical, an Ensign Tactical, a full Commander Engineering, a Lieutenant Engineering and a Lieutenant Universal. It's not quite as flexible as the Odyssey class, but it's pretty close. And I'll run through my abilities. I'll go from Tactical Engineering and then Science. And as you know, there isn't any dedicated science, so chances are you're going to use the Universal Lieutenant for Science abilities. But you could drop it if you're running in a good team and someone else can drop you the heals and transfer to your strength. So, in the Tactical Wise, in the Lieutenant Commander, I'm running Beam Overload 1. Mainly because this is running as an assault, so basically I'm hitting the target as best I can. So I'm going to want to do more heavy damage with my overload than fire at will. And then using high yield 2 to do torpedo damage. And then I've got the ever favourite attack pattern Omega. And basically this gives you the bonus to your flight speed, turn rate, plus to your damage resistance, and a plus to your damage that you do over a period of time. It also gives you an immunity to teleports and an extra bonus to your defence. So quite useful there. 
And then in the Ensign Tactical, I'm running Tac Team 1 to distribute my shields and also to increase my energy weapon damage and projectile damage skill by 18 as well. I've also got a duty officer in it to reduce it as well, which we'll go into duty officers a bit later. In the full commander is my normal character Penny, who's my usual engineer in most of my cruisers that have a full commander slot. And it's basically engineering team one, emergency to dampeners for the kinetic resistance and the ability to turn the ship quicker, emergency powered shields to bring my shields up better, and then auxiliary to structure integrity three for the quick heal, which I do admit I use auxiliary a lot. I use inertial dampeners selectively, so if I see the ball torpedoes coming my way or a very hefty torpedo salvo, then I will pop auxiliary to inertial dampeners rather than running. Um, structural integrity and then over in the lieutenant engineering I've got emergency power shields one for again another shield heal and then a little bit of a break is I'm using direct energy modulation now this ability works really well with cannons more so than beam arrays but I'm having pretty good success with it so at the moment it's staying in this particular test um, my operations obviously will never use direct energy modulation with the current bridge officer setup as it is at the moment uh, but the assault crew is running a little bit more offensively, uh, so she's a little bit more restricted in what she does. She's more offensive than the operations, which is more multi role. Um, I'm getting the plus 27.2 to shield penetration, extra damage per pulse, so every beam fires, I get that plus 27. And there's also a duty officer that's affecting the weapon system energy drain, which I'll go into shortly in a moment. And I'll explain that very, very shortly. Now, the Lieutenant Universal is obviously running my science tune in there, bridge officer, and she's running Hazard Emitters 1 to clear debuffs and for a heal plus damage resistance as well. Running this one rather than polarise the hole because I'm forever getting plasma fired from Borg in SCFs. And then I'm running Transfer Shield Strength 2 as an extra bonus to my shields. Now, basically, what it basically means that the ship's running three shield heals and she's running three hole repair heals as well so can't complain there's, pl there's enough heals there for myself as well as for friendly people that I'm in pugs in for example in fleet missions so yeah that's pretty much the build that I'm using for the region but what I will go into is obviously the duty officers just so you can get an understanding of them in the space ones it's a little bit different to my operations obviously I'm running four purples and one blue at the moment. I'm still trying to track down a decently priced energy weapons officer. But I'm running a purple con officer, which is a reduction in tactical team, because I do use tactical team on an awful lot. I do try and distribute my shields manually, but there's no substitute for hitting tactical team, especially if you're getting alpha attacks in PvP. I've got a blue energy weapons officer. This is the one that affects um, beam overload and fire at wood. It reduces the recharge time for it to kick in. And it's basically a 50% chance to reduce the recharge time by 7.5 seconds. So, in my opinion, it's definitely worth it in, uh, running on this one, especially as this one's an assault vessel. And primarily my damage is spec for beams rather than torpedoes, so I use my beam arrays a lot. So, on this one I do use beam overload 1 a lot. I could put beam overload 2 in here, maybe even 3, but I tend to favor 1. It, it's enough for me, it gets your shields down. Then I'm running a damage control engineer, a purple, and he's basically a 35% chance of reducing the reduction time to emergency powered subsystems, so it's basically 35% chance of reducing the time that emergency powered shields kicks in. And I'm running one maintenance engineer, which is basically reduces the time for engineering team by 8 seconds, and it also gives me obviously the plus 10 starship power repair for 15 seconds. And then last but by no means least, I'm running a purple systems engineer. Now the reason I'm running this is that this particular duty officer gives you a reduction in the weapon subsystem energy drain for 8 seconds when you use direct energy modulation. So when I'm using beam overload, if I don't have nade only version or EPS transfer off running but I may have a battery, what I will do is I will pop direct energy modulation and then hit beam overload so that and I get a 200 resistance to my weapon system drain for 8 seconds so my weapons are going to be drained a lot less for 8 seconds and that's enough to hit a beam overload and with a combination of a battery or no on inversion or EPS transfer that boosts all my weapons that one's a resistance drain so it reduces the drain on the subsystem, all subsystems it basically means I keep my weapons at a higher power level so they're doing more damage very useful one 
Um, this is also a really good one if you're running a cannon build, although cannons don't drain anywhere near as much power as beam arrays. But if you are running them on beam, uh, sorry, not beam overload, but rapid fire, then you might want to consider the using the um, and slotting that particular uh, duty officer into position as part of your space set. Uh, most of my set is pretty much I can come and go with a lot of these. If I really, really wanted to, and if I'm totally honest, I tend not to use engineering team as much with this particular ship. And I could probably drop the maintenance engineer and put my ever faithful maintenance engineer in that does the extras if I use batteries. So say for example if I used a battery it would give me the 10% increase in damage for 10 seconds. If I use a shield one it would give me damage resistance for 10, by 10% for 10 seconds. So you can see how this build's quite flexible. You can, in it, you can switch it out a little bit. And if you don't use engineering team as much but you are using the emergency structure integrity field a lot and I do use that more than I use engineering team I will take out the maintenance engineer and slot this one in for the extra abilities for the batteries. On this particular build, I do find myself going through batteries, not shield batteries, but I certainly go through engine uh, weapon batteries, sorry, to keep, make sure I keep power up when I'm using beam overload. So this one really does more assault. My Odyssey uses the fire at will to distract and grab aggro, whereas this ship's just there to pulverize really the opponents. So something to bear in mind there. Now, last but my name is least, I suppose I ought to very quickly go into the passives on the characters that I use here. Now, if you look at Neku in the Universal Lieutenant and Neku um, character and roleplay, they're both actually sisters. Um, they are Surians, and Surians, both of them have the particular passive abilities. And they have basic creativity which is a plus 2.5 to damage and hit points, which is a ground trait. They have natural immunities, which is also another ground trait. The reason I actually have them is for their efficient, which is a space trait. And basically, both these characters give me a plus 7.1 starship warp core efficiency, so I'm getting times 7.5 by 2. So it's why I can hold pretty high power levels on my Odyssey. Now, the way my consoles are decked out, because this class only has four uh, engineering, not five console slots, my engines are just a little bit lower than usual because they run at 56, but I'm still getting a pretty decent bonus because I can still run my shields and auxiliary at 61, and then obviously my weapon power is running at 125. And in fact, I've got it dialed down to 95, and 125, which is giving me some decent figures. So that works quite nicely on this particular build. So that's my choice in those two. Fasu is my diplomatic character that I got when I reached tier 5, diplomatic before the reputation system, uh, the duty officer sorry, system kicked in. And she, her passives are not really there, they're mainly just ground ones unfortunately. Um, so they're ground traits, so she's lucky, basic lucky and creativity there. Uh, so juice is quite useful actually on the ground, I've seen that too and use it quite frequently. Um, seductive is also quite useful as well. Now, Penny is a unique Borg officer, and she's got some unique traits. And she, these are unfortunately ground traits, but they are quite useful. She does actually use them now. One of the other things is she's also efficient. So again, I've now got three lots of 7.5 Starship Warp Core efficiency. So I'm squeezing absolutely the maximum amount of power I can out of my Warp Core with my particular build. Now I know my skills on my character on this engineering tune they are not the absolute best on warp core efficiency and warp core potential but they've both got six points invested in them so I'm getting some decent figures out of them. So that's those and just last but no means least we'll go through Stu who's uh, the android as one of the veteran rewards and his traits are not uh, pretty much on ground unfortunately but I'll let you just have a quick look at them you can see them ground abilities which is a shame it'd be nice to have seen a space ability there but I wanted just to put the android in there, I wanted to put him somewhere and I was trying to work out where and I thought well actually with direct energy modulation and most power shields is not a bad idea. I could put a human in there for the leadership that adds to the whole regeneration but I decided to just go for this one, it's more for character story wise really. So yeah that's pretty much my build for the Assault Cruiser Refit, the Regent, this is one I use on this one and it works very effectively. And it surprised me how good this ship is actually. Um, as I said, the bridge officer layout is not as flexible as the operations, obviously, but if you want to run more offensively, then you might consider this ship. 
although I suspect that a lot of people would probably go for the Excelsior, especially the fleet one. I can't say I blame them because when you look at the figures on paper or on screen, um, the Excel does shine more brightly. Um, but the Assault Cruiser refit is actually very surprising and can do very well. And I think it can certainly hold its own against the Excelsiors in my opinion. But again, it's play style and build spec. It's what you think works particularly best for you. So I hope you enjoyed this. As I said, this was a little bit of a shout out for Boldy Day Road, who I've been enjoying his new channel as he's been setting up and enjoying his observations. And as I said, it's kind of like a video response to his. And I'll put a link to his channel actually in my description notes later when I put this video up. So hope you enjoyed. Feel free to ask any questions, I don't mind. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll be kicking off the KDF series shortly. I'm gonna go have a nice cup of coffee and some breakfast and then get cracking on that. And then I've just got a separate project that's where I'm working on, which is our fleet YouTube page for my fleet mates that watch my channel. Um, I'm going to be sitting down this weekend and kicking off that channel as well. So keep an eye out for that. And I'll probably link that as well in my main personal YouTube channel. And so it gets linked to the fleet one. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And look forward to speaking to you again when I kick off the Klingon series. Thank you. Bye-bye.